Good afternoon, everyone, both here in the church and online. I welcome these bright lights to provide a little extra heat on this really cold day. My name is Kathy Stanford, and I'm a member of the Dreaming Committee, and I'll be your MC this afternoon. On behalf of the Dreaming Committee, I want to thank all of you for being here. It is heartwarming to see the interest in Our Lady of Guadalupe Parish. We have approximately 13 people in person and over 60 online. As you know, this is a process, and if you know someone who could not join this afternoon, we will record the meeting, and they could watch it during the next weeks and join us for our next meeting on Saturday, February 5th. We would absolutely love to have you. We will also be meeting with other groups over the next month or so, and if you want to reach out to us, our email address is dreaming at ourladyofguadalupe.ca. As we begin today, I would like to ask Dorothy Wincy to come forward for our opening prayer. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for all those who came, bravely came out in the cold, and those who chose to stay on Zoom. Smart move. <laughs> anyway, so as we're ready to embark, let us all place ourselves in God's presence. Heavenly Father, we stand before you with open hearts and open minds. We have heard and believe in your call to renew and unify our parish through evangelization, mission, and service. We ask you for your guidance, your wisdom, and inspiration as we share this time together to dream about our future of Our Lady of Guadalupe Parish. Keep within us a spirit of joy and enthusiasm as we embark on our dreaming process and continue to remind us that all that we do here today and all that we accomplish in the future is for your greater glory. We ask this through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Our Lady of Guadalupe, I hope we have a great meeting. Thank you very much, Dorothy. I'd like to introduce my fellow team members of the Dreaming Committee. Here in the church, we have D Tony Johnstone, and there he is, and he's the chair of our committee, and Malcolm Perkins, who's standing right there in the aisle for those online. Online, we have Mariana Carrera, Jessica Leslie, Heather Johnstone, and Bob McKay. Some will lead you in discussion this, this afternoon in our breakout rooms or small groups in the church. We also have other parishioners who kindly agreed to assist in the process due to the wonderful response and interest we have. This committee was formed to gather input from all parishioners as a result of the foundation series, followed by the recommendation of the options committee, which was option number four, the renewal of St. Peter's site to serve the needs of Our Lady of Guadalupe Parish. Let's begin today looking at the word dream. It's a verb. It means action. It's to indulge in daydreams or fantasies about something greatly desired, wished for, hoped for, etc. How often do we daydream? 
Or, when was the last time you found yourself in that space? Daydreams are triggered by real life events such as noise, smell, a conversation topic, or a movie. Let me share a story with you. I have a 15 month old granddaughter, Mabel Grace, who drifts so naturally into the daydream state. Often when I'm playing with her or helping her to have a meal, she just goes off. I admire this in her. I wonder what is floating in her mind at this time. Today, and as we move forward through this process, I want to encourage you to allow yourself to indulge in a daydream. We are all from former parishes. What is it about our former parishes that we would start, we would stop, or we would continue? What is it about our former parish that we want to continue? What was it that was so great we want others now and into the future to feel this experience? What is it we want to stop because it doesn't serve us or others? And can we be excited about what we want to start? We have a clean canvas, a fresh start. Our Lady of Guadalupe Parish can be what we dream it to be. We all have a role to play in joining together to dream, to create our greatest desires, our wishes, and our hopes for our parish together. Today, let our exciting daydreaming journey begin, and let's have some fun doing it. It will be an exciting three-step process. In session one today, you'll have an opportunity to provide some ideas. You will have the opportunity to discuss the idea of a renewed building. What assumptions about the purpose of our parish and our buildings have been challenged? Finally, we will determine some of the qualities, the characteristics, and the values that you personally feel are important for our parish and its mission into the future. Session two will be about the future and what the parish needs may be, what we can imagine them to be to the best of our ability. We will take several of the values, all of the values, but we will assign several to each group in our second session to discuss how these values will shape our space moving forward. Session three will review the ideas presented in session two and we'll work with some floor maps in small groups and we'll present our ideas back to one another. The Dreaming Committee really hopes you will all join us every two weeks, both on February 5th and February 19th, to complete this process and provide us with some very exciting dreams. So as we begin today, our agenda will be, we will hear from our pastor, Father James Mallon, first. Then we'll move into small group discussions and online breakout rooms. You will be guided in your discussions with questions to reflect upon as you each will have a facilitator. I want you to think about start, stop, and continue 
as we evaluate where we've been and where we want to go. We'll do a debrief, which will permit uh, groups to report back as time permits. And then finally, we'll have a sum summation by Father Malin and a closing prayer. So as we move forward today, I would like to give a warm welcome to Father Malin as he addresses us. <laughs> as I'm going to use this mic, not this one. Be good. Uh, Kathy, thanks for your words. I love what you said about dreaming, about dreams, and, uh, and giving us permission to have fun. This, this is serious, but we shouldn't be too serious about it. You know what I mean? Let's have fun. Let's have fun, because the ultimate goal of what we're about is really, is really discerning. Like, what is God calling us to do for the sake of the mission? That, that's the real question. No, no, it's okay. I'll just move it. Uh, Brad was gone. I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> yeah, he says, no, you know, I feel I do that to him all, all, all the time. It reminded me, Kathy, of something I heard once. I heard someone say, don't howl your dreams to death. Wow them into existence. Interesting, huh? Don't howl your dreams to death. Wow them into existence. And, and I hope today, in the next two weeks, for the next two sessions, we can, we can wow these dreams into some embodiment of reality. And it's, it's so easy for us to immediately say, yeah, but how, how could we ever do that? And we can, we can how things to death. And you know, we have to get to the how. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a ton of work that is going to lie ahead of us if any of this is going to come into reality. But the how comes later. N now is the time for wow. So you ready to wow it up? Ready online? Uh, am I looking at this ca camera for online? Hey, everyone, it's great to see you. I see all your, all your Brady Bunch faces. Um, the folks operating the, the Zoom screen, if you, can, if you can cycle through them from time to time so I can see all these lovely faces there, that'd be, that'd be great. But I am gonna start my presentation, slight presentation in a moment, so I won't see your faces um, soon. But I wanna thank you all for being here, for taking the time and making the best of this situation with, uh, with the pandemic. And you know, imagine trying to do this, this kind of planning and dreaming and on top of a global pandemic, but this is, this is what we have. We've got no choice on this. So I'm just going to um, set up my, uh, my presentation here. Uh, which computer am I on, MacBook Air 2 or MacBook Air 1? Two, number two, thank you. Um, hopefully we'll be able to get all this working properly. St. Peter's Church Network. There we go. Okay, so first thing I want to speak about is the journey so far. Now, Kathy, in her introduction, gave us a bit of context that what we're doing today is really uh, a continuation of a journey that we began, I believe it was late September 2020. I had been in the parish for just less than two months, and we wanted to immediately begin to talk about some important questions, so wh where we are, where we're going, where God is calling us to be. And we call that series New Foundations. The very idea of a new foundation, I mean, it, we proposed a seven week, a seven series set of meetings uh, that would lay foundations for our future, and we had, in total, about 150 different people participated on that journey. Uh, we had so many gathering in person, then we get hit with another, 
round of COVID and we went into lockdown and it was a bit messy, but we get through it all. And I just want to review with you what we covered. So our first week was looking at the subject of where are we? And that was a, that was a challenging week because we, it was like getting a bucket of ice water thrown over, thrown over us. We looked at statistics. We looked at the trends over the last 50 years. And s some of those statistics, and well, most of them were very, very disturbing because what did it tell us? It told us we're dying. That's not good news to hear. But all the, vital, all the vital signs told us we were dying and we were dying rapidly. And it was difficult, but we invited people to look at these numbers through the lens of hope. Because guess what? What do we say every single Sunday? I believe in the resurrection of the dead, right? Like God can bring dying things back to life. And, and here's the truth of it. Many churches, not just our church, but many churches are dying. We don't need to be. The reason we're dying, and this is such a conviction of mine, the reason we're dying is because we're clinging to old ways of doing things. We need to, the world around us has changed. We need to change our methodologies. There are some things that don't change, of course. Some things don't change. But how we do things, how we do things must change. Brothers and sisters, if we don't change how we do things, we're going to be gone. We're going to be wiped off in the next 10 years. So that was week one. Week two looked at where are we being called to go. So we looked at scripture. We looked at the Great Commission. We looked at the teachings of the church. We looked at, can you bring the volume down? It's just getting really loud out here. We looked at uh, different documents of the church, uh, writings of the popes, Pope Francis, uh, writings from our own bishop in the document from our own diocese, the visioning document known as communities of missionary disciples. So week one, where we are. Week two, where we're being called. Week three, we looked at the question of dreaming. So this is not the first time we're gathering as a community to talk about our dream for the parish. And although today we're focusing more on the idea of the dream for this, for this location, for the, for the physical uh, part of the parish, we, back in late October, early November, looked at the question of the, the dream for our parish. And all of these sessions are on our YouTube channel if you want to go back and look at them. Uh, then we had a, a session called Changing Our Minds. Because here's the thing, the church calls what we're talking about pastoral conversion. And the call to pastoral conversion has been around for 25 years or so coming from the popes. And pastoral conversion means converting or changing our methodologies for the sake of the mission. That's what the church means. And by pastoral conversion, we mean conversion. It's, it's a real conversion. And the word in, from the Gospels in Greek for conversion is metanoia, which means to change your mind. See, <laughs> There's no change in our realities unless there's a change in us. Because if, if we prefer our methodology to the mission, then that's not going to change unless we change our minds. And when we change our minds, God changes our hearts. And so that was week four. Week five, we looked at our resources, our human resources, our spiritual resources. We looked at the fact that the giftedness all that we need to bring renewal to our parish is already here. It's in the pews. It just so often is, has never been activated. Then the next week we looked at our physical and financial resources. And uh, in week seven we looked at the question of how do we move forward from there? And from that point we formed a number of working committees and groups that began to work in different aspects of parish life. And we also formed the, the options committee. So this took us into, into March, April last year, and the options committee uh, worked with, with five options, or really four real options, because the first option wasn't a real option. But there were five options outlined for the central location. And through the new foundation series, we had discerned that our future parish should have at least should have two locations, that we needed to have a location in North Dartmouth because of our unique situation as a parish 
and the presence of, of poverty and how we could have a second location uh, specifically dedicated to, to uh, various means of outreach to serve the poor. Uh, but what would our main location be? We needed a main location that would be where we gathered for the Eucharist that was our central location. And I want to outline these five options that were part of the options committee. Uh, the first option was to do nothing. No one was up for that um, because that's basically what we had been doing for the last 20 years. And if we continued with option one, the eff effects of option one would continue to work on us, which means this, this line going, going way down. Uh, um, option two was to sell everything. Like literally, we, the committee looked into this, selling all of our properties and finding a brand new piece of land somewhere else in our parish boundaries and building a brand new building. Uh, they, they looked at every available piece of real estate to boil it all down. There was no piece of real estate that, that worked, that was really available, nothing in the central region. And besides, even if we found it and built a new church, it would be like $40 million. <laughs> we don't have $40 million. We don't have any money. So that wasn't a very good one. Uh, option three was to uh, sell off um, the, the excess buildings and repair and move to this location. This location simply to restore it to its 1968 pristine standards would be is about two million bucks. Um, the committee and I agreed that this was not a, a, a good one for a number of reasons. Number one, effectively we would be basically selling off the the other parishes that made up this parish and just using the, the proceeds to repair ourselves. So therefore, you know, basically it would mean that traditional St. Peter's parishioners would be say, well, you guys shut down and we're just going to cannibalize you so that we don't have to change. So that's not very good. And the other thing too is there was a recognition is that buildings really shape our community. And there are real limitations. We're going to get into this in a moment. Real limitations with this building because the, the strength of this building is its weakness. The strength is the amazing experience. Like the interior of this space is, I believe, is one of the most, for me anyway, one of the most beautiful experiences of worship. I, this is a unique building and it's beautiful and as a place of worship. But it's got seven doors to a parking lot. And it was built at a time, although it was incredibly innovative at the time in here, it was still built with a Christendom mentality that said the other side of the doors is not mission territory. You know, we live in a Christian culture, you know, and the world has changed so drastically since the 1960s, right? We're in a very, very different world. So there was a, a sense that, 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 again, if we simply keep this as it is, we're, we're being burdened with a design uh, from a, a, a distant era. Although I know some of you were here, but in terms of change, sociological change, that was that might as well have been a thousand years ago. You know, uh, option four was to upgrade this location as a central location. Um, that required to make sure that this building was sound and we, we had a very in-depth engineering study done of this building and we found out that the bones are solid, the ship is solid, this building is good, it needs work, everything except the bell tower is solid, the bell tower is ready to fall down. So, but we could do it, we could upgrade it and then option five was to demolish this location and this building and build a brand new church on this property, um, which was looked at, but it would be about at least double the cost of renewing the building. So the co building committee came up with a choice. They landed at option four, which is why we're here today, because they landed at option four that our, our parish for the future would be a two location parish at St. Anthony's, a place of outreach for the poor uh, in different activities, gathering with the community, with a chapel for daily mass, so there would still be uh, a spiritual presence there and a central location here. This report was accepted by the pastoral council. It was taken by the pastoral council and became a part of the 
of the first report we sent to the bishop, yeah, it's 180 pages. This was the phase one report that was sent to Archbishop, Archbishop Dunn on Je July 23rd. And so right before the summer break. So this was phase one report in September, the Archbishop got back to us and said that it had been accepted by the Council of Priests, and he basically gave the go-ahead. What it is, it basically says that we believe it's worthy of continuing to move on. And you may remember Archbishop Dunn came here in October and, and began a process, launched the process of consultation around the question of the closure of our buildings. Uh, then we, we had formed the listening committee. Am I good? Okay, sorry. Uh, we formed the listening committee and the listening committee had several large group meetings. They met, they did an ex exceptional job. They had all kinds of meetings. They listened to people. We gathered all of what we heard into a second report which was put on the Archbishop's desk on January 7th. So this was volume two, and it includes a summary of everything we heard and uh, even the, the, uh, the speaking notes of people who, who spoke. So if you submitted in this process any speaking notes whatsoever, everything is in here and everything was put on the Bishop's desk. And where this stands right now is there I found out there was a meeting of the Council of Priests on, on Wednesday last week, and the bishop told me that this would be discussed then, and so that's where it is. We're waiting to hear back. If the Council of Priests approve and the bishop gives the yes, he will issue a decree of closure, which would give us a date for the buildings to be, to be closed for, for sacred purposes. There's a 60-day period in which uh, people, if they want to appeal, in a sense, to the Supreme Court in Rome, they can do that, which could maybe lengthen this process by another six months to another year. But that's where that process is at right now. We also planned this dreaming process, and we decided to wait until the listening process was over to begin. And so that brings me up to date to where we are right now, okay? Okay. So you see yourself as we gather for this first meeting that it's part of a long process so far and a process that has still, we still have a lot of work to do, lots and lots of work. But if we don't start, even though there might be uncertainties, we're never, we're, we, won't, we won't start. And <laughs> we've got to start from where we are. I'm reminded of the words of Nelson Mandela about uh, the reality of dreaming when he said this, there's no passion to be found playing small and settling for a life that is less than the one you are capable of living. And as we enter into this exercise in the next number of weeks, I want to invite you to, to, to think big, you know, think big. Don't worry about, is my idea or is my dream too crazy? We'll, we'll land at reality at some point, but we've got to begin. So it, begin big. So that's what I want to invite you to do. I want to also take a moment to look at some of the assumptions that we can sometimes make around the life of the church. In the 1970s, the uh, Cardinal uh, Avery Dulles wrote a very famous book on ecclesiology, which means the theology of the church, and it was called Models of the Church. I have a uh, uh, 1978 version, and it was very famous book. It, by model of the church, what he meant was there are different theological ways to which we can view the church and we can understand the church. And each of these models have a degree of truth to them. They all come, they come together to make up a part of the whole. And so that was his famous book. And out of this, um, I'd like to talk about models of the parish. I'm not trying to compete with Avery Dulles. But I want to talk about models of the parish. So what are some of the things that we can sometimes assume? And the things about assumptions is we don't know what we're making them, right? We just, why, do we, why are we not aware of them? Because we, we just assume that this is the way it is. Identifying our assumptions are very, very important, especially as we go forward and make some concrete recommendations and decisions. 
uh, Winston Churchill said this, we shape our buildings, thereafter they shape us. I want you to think for a moment, especially those of you who have a history at the St. Peter's location, how has the lack of a gathering space or uh, attached gathering spaces, I know that we in the past had the school, which we haven't really been able to use for the last uh, t 10 years or so, and we have the parish center, of course, we, we have that. But how has that lack of connected space shaped this community? You don't have to answer it right now, but it's a very interesting question, isn't it? As opposed to parishes that have a gathering space where they, where they can meet together. How has the fact that this building, that in a sense, 95%, 98%, I don't know, of the floor space is, is for sacred worship, how has that shaped our, our ex experience of church? There were assumptions that the architects brought to this process in the 1960s that have shaped us. And so as we consider reshaping this building, we need to identify our assumptions. So let's have a little bit of fun with this. The first one is uh, parish as school. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, especially those of us I from an English-speaking perspective in, in Canada, in the United States, in the United Kingdom, New Zealand, Australia, remember in in the English-speaking world, Catholicism was illegal up until the late 18th century. And so Catholicism was reborn institutionally in the 19th century. In fact, the, the first, <laughs> the, do you know where the place where these laws were repealed? For the entire English-speaking British Empire? Halifax. It was the Irish Catholics in Halifax who, re, who led the repeal. And the laws were repealed in, in London, England. And that impacted the entire English-speaking world from Halifax. And you know what they built within three weeks? St. Peter's Church, the little wooden church. Some of the artwork is right over there in the corner. And the, the, the elements of that church were brought across the harbor and set up downtown Dartmouth until uh, the late 1880s when they built the, the first church on this location. But with that, with that experience of, of, of Catholics being mostly an immigrant population who were socially excluded, one of the main goals of the church throughout the English-speaking world is how do we educate and mainstream our people to be part, a functioning part of society? So virtually it grew up that beside every place of worship was a school, parish school, parish school, house for the sisters to teach the kids. Because getting an education and getting mainstreamed was a critical part of, of being part of this, of this new world. And so this idea as parishes school has really shaped us. Churchill Academy next door, that was St. Peter's School. The school behind it was the, was the older school. Some of you went to those schools. Now we don't have a Catholic school system in Nova Scotia, but you go to other parts of Canada and you speak to the priests in the parishes, a lot of time and energy goes into the schools. In the United States, many, in many places in the US, 60% of, of their available resources go into sustaining a school. Even though the fruitfulness in terms of raising the next generation of believers in the Catholic school system, regardless of what country you're in, is not much better off than it is anywhere else. So there's in a sense that this, this assumption that the parish is, is a school has deeply impacted us. I want to give you just one final example about this. Now, you know that my last parish before here was St. Benedict Parish, and I know that whenever sometimes I mention St. Benedict Parish, some people say, oh, here he goes again. But I'm saying, give me a break. I spent 10 years of my life there, almost. Yeah, I did. Uh, and it really impacted me. But when I first went there to the building, it was before it was finished. And I just found out I was going, but it, was, it wasn't public. And I got a tour of the building, and my heart sank. Because you know what I saw? In the downstairs basement, this amazing space that could have been put to real, a real creative use, it was chopped up into little tiny boxes, classrooms. They built classrooms for catechesis, for catechism classes. Parish as school impacted 
the shape of that building which impacted our ability to function. Just an example. The next one is Parish's Social Club. And this is very, very important. The most important word in this slide is the word club. You see, the difference between the church and a club is that a club exists for its members. A church exists for those who are not members. See, sometimes we can think about our building or renewing buildings and say, oh, this is for us. This is all about us. It's like, no, it's not. That's called a club. We're not Our Lady of Guadalupe Catholic Club. We're Our Lady of Guadalupe Parish. This building, everything that we have, exists for the sake of mission. And when we're talking about renewing our buildings, it's for the sake of mission. It's, and a social club is a very prevalent mindset in Catholic parishes. You know, over the years as I've gone into parishes as parish priest, uh, from my very first par uh, parish, I had to, I arrived in situations where our buildings were used almost exclusively by parish and community groups for social activities. Cards, card socials, bingos, basketball, cubs and scouts. Now there's nothing wrong with these things, but we couldn't use our own buildings for, for the sake of evangelization and, and faith formation. We had to fight to, re to even get our buildings for one night. In my first parish, it happened in every single parish I, I was ever in. The only parish I haven't had that problem, Our Lady of Guadalupe, because of COVID. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what was happening pre-COVID here, but every single parish, I had to, we had to fight to get our own space to do the work of evangelization and discipleship because it was, the buildings were being used as a club. A third, another one is parishes gas station. And what do I mean by this? Well, the parish is where you go to get your sacrament. And as you can see from this picture, it's, a, it's for the most part anonymous. You know that idea of Catholics Anonymous? You, you come in, you get your, get your communion, and you get out. And, the only, and whether it's if you come every week or you only come to church to get sacraments, a couple of times a year or when you're a kid at a particular age. It's a reduction of the church and the life of the church to, to getting something, to getting, getting a sacrament. There's no human interaction. There's no, there's no experience of community. Um, it's you come, you fill up, you go. And that is many, quite often, it's an assumption that people bring. Another one is parishes food bank. Now, what do I mean by this? We're blessed here to have uh, food storage. St. Vincent de Paul here has, has been doing this for years, taking food to people's homes. Uh, we've got the partnership with the food bank in, in the North Dartmouth location. And I have to say that of all the parishes I've ever been in, this parish, the work this parish does with feeding and supporting the, the poor, especially the hungry, is, is exceptional. It's absolutely phenomenal. Feeding, I was hungry and you gave me food to eat. Jesus said it, we better do it. So it's a, it's a necessary thing with what we do. But when I bring this up, what I'm saying is that it can't be the, the core purpose. It can't be the core purpose. And I'll tell you why. And I've used this image before. It doesn't matter what good work you do with your, with your hands if your heart is giving out. Because it's, it's, it's not going to last. Uh, if the heart is weak, that the, the main thing is strengthening the heart so that the hands can continue to work for decades and decades and decades and decades to come. And right now in the history of our parish, the heart is weak. The heart is weak. So evangelization and discipleship have to be at the center. And therefore, we can continue to do this good work for generations to come. That's the goal. Uh, another image is parish's funeral home, but possibly not a major issue here at this parish. But uh, when I was in, um, in my last parish, it was it basically the whole parish, the building of the parish was sold on the idea that St. Benedict would be a great place to have your funeral. It's got a great foyer, it's got a great church, it's got an elevator and a hall for reception. And I ran smack into this when we were running evangelistic programs and we were, we were, there was an expectation that we cancel 
things like Alpha or a summer camp for kids who didn't go to church, that they should be canceled with one day's notice in order to have a funeral reception in, in the hall. So there was that, again, I experienced how assumptions can shape how we view a building. And finally, the, the final one is, uh, or almost final one is, parishes community center. That is uh, a parish who's, who's got, whose building serves the purpose of being able to be rented or given away for free to members of the community. So again, that's sometimes how we think about parishes. But the one I want to propose to you is this, parishes photocopier. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, photocopier, not in the sense that we duplicate things, but a photocopier brings paper in, it processes it, and sends it out. It's like the work of evangelization. We've got to bring people in, into relationship with Jesus, into the church, to the sacraments, process them, help them to grow, and help them to live as disciples, to send them out. That's, that's, that's the, the process. And so it's that evangelizing mission and the need to make disciples. And if we get that right, that's, that's what's going to allow us to move into the future. I want to quickly talk about systems. And some of you have heard me say this before, that in the human body, there are 10 systems. You think of the circulatory system, the, the nervous system, the lymphat lymphatic system, and all of this. In order for us to be healthy, all 10 must be functioning well. If even one of them is off, we're not going to be, we're going to be unwell. Um, and it's the same in the church. The church has five systems. Uh, and this comes from Scripture. But think about this for a second. Uh, worship, ministry, community, discipleship, evangelization. Worship, obviously, you know what, the, what that is. Ministry is service. Anytime someone is served, ministry is happening. Community is when people know and love one another, are accountable to one another. It's not the same as socializing, Christian community. Discipleship is when people who are in relationship with Jesus are growing and maturing intentionally, and evangelization is bringing new people in. Now think about us as Catholics, even as our parish. We're, we're pretty, we're okay at worship. We all do that. Ministry, we usually do okay at ministry, at least a certain percentage of parishioners do. Community, usually not so strong in Catholic parishes. Discipleship, usually it's between 5 to 10% of people. In evangelization, in many churches, it's almost zero. Think about these systems in terms of our building and what our present shape of our building facilitates. It's obvious that the main purpose of this building had in mind was what? It was worship. Worship. Worship in an experience of community. I mean, you, gotta, you can't be at Mass in this place and not look at each other. So that's a good thing. But looking at each other ain't enough, people. Looking at each other doesn't mean we know each other. It doesn't mean we love each other or support each other. So we need, we need more than this. And so we need to be able to have a building that facilitates uh, community discipleship in evangelization. A lot of our ministry is done outside of the building, and, and, and that's not really restricted, I don't think, by this present building. But discipleship, evangelization, and community are. Pope Francis said this, it's this dream of his missionary option, a missionary impulse capable of transforming everything so that the church's customs, ways of doing things, times and schedules, language and structures, language and structures can be suitably channeled for the evangelization of today's world rather than her for her self-preservation. So we're not just talking about self-preservation here. We are talking about evangelization. Now, there was a Vatican document that came out just a year and a half ago on the, co the question of pastoral conversion for the sake of the evangelizing mission of the church. And I want to share with you, I'm going to skip over the first quote, but the second one, if the parish does not exude that spiritual dynamic of evangelization, it runs the risk of becoming self-referential and fossilized, offering experiences that are devoid of evangelical flavor and missionary drive of interest only to small groups. Now, does that sound familiar? Because it should, because it's effectively what's been happening to most of our parishes for the last 30, 40 years. 
In our own parish, look at these statistics. We looked at these during the New Foundation series. These are the number of infant baptisms in 10 year periods from 1969 to 2019. 1969 was the first fully functioning year of this building. 1969, for, for me, was a good year to be baptized, speaking personally. Um, but look at what's happened. What does that mean for our future? Look at this, this is even worse, the number of marriages. Do you know what these statistics tell us? That the pastoral method of the past to ensure our future is kaput. And what was that methodology? Catholic babies grow up and get married and have Catholic babies who grow up and get married and have Catholic babies who grow up and get married, have Catholic babies, etc., etc. It doesn't happen anymore. Brothers and sisters, the only church that is going to exist in the future is the church that rediscovers and embraces its evangelizing mission to make disciples of all nations. A church that doesn't do that is not going to exist. And I believe God wants us to exist. We're, I believe that God wants us to change that pattern. I wouldn't be standing here if it was not so. And here's another critical issue for us. Look at this. These are the demographics of our Lady of Guadalupe Parish from 2017. It tells us that we have totally failed to engage younger families. Now we can say, well, it's the culture, it's not our problem. No, there are churches that are, that are doing this. Every church in every tradition is struggling to be sure. It's a difficult time, but there are churches that are able to do this much better than we are, and we can learn. And there are things that we can do. Um, and I think one of the, the key principles for us, and I'm just finishing off here a few more minutes, is we need to embrace this, this dynamic of belong, believe, behave. Now, what do I mean by this? You see, in the past, <clears throat> you may remember you know, think about some of you, when you, if you grew up, say, maybe in the 60s, you knew, you knew how you were supposed to behave, right? There was clear indication about how you were supposed to behave. And we generally knew what we were supposed to believe. There was what we believed and what those people over there believed. And if you behaved and believed, then you could belong. And if we're going to fulfill our missionary calling today in a post-Christian culture, we need to flip that around, which means we need to begin with belonging, which leads people to change their beliefs and eventually change their lifestyles or their behaviors. If we demand change of lifestyle first or change of belief before you can belong, we don't have a future. And so the critical question for us is how do we create spaces of belonging for people who do not yet believe and don't behave. Now, in the future and already in the present, a lot of that's done off-site. It's done in people's homes, people gathering in small groups. But think about it in terms of, of our location of our building when almost all of our present building is the worship space, is the place where the Eucharist is celebrated, the place where things happen that presume you know how to behave, you know what to do. And you know what it is that's happening and you know what to believe. So in terms of options as we look forward into the future, yeah, there, there's going to be good ideas, there's going to be best ideas and better ideas. I'm not sure what those are right now. We've got a lot to, a lot to discover together. Uh, we've got to journey together. But I want to simply give you a framework as I conclude. And I want to show you 20 seconds of video footage from the drone footage that we got when we had the engineering study done, what they, the engineers had to examine the bell tower. And rather than climbing up on it, they got a drone. And this is a little clip of the drone footage. You can recognize there's, there's our building. It's quite weird, isn't it? You see, did you know that the building is shaped like a cross from above? That's a very traditional form of architecture that a, a, a church would be shaped like a cross. So basically what we're starting from in terms of an engineering perspective is simply 
this, or not simply perhaps, but that's in a sense the footprint within which we can dream with regard to this location. Remember, the future dream for our parish is bigger than this. It includes North Dartmouth. It includes the St. Anthony's location and everything that's happening there. And finally, just as I conclude, I finally, finally conclude, it's just to remind you again of the why of all of this. The reason for all of this process is to answer this question. What is God calling us to do for the sake of our missionary calling? For the sake of our mission, not for ourselves. What, it's not what is God calling us to do for ourselves. What is God calling us to do for the sake of our mission as he calls us into the future? So thank you very much for your attention. So now as we move forward, we're going to have an opportunity to debrief your discussions, to report back. We're going to give each group approximately two minutes uh, to give us a summary of what you discussed, some of the highlights, but most importantly, I have a scribe here who is going to be recording your values, your characteristics, your qualities that you've come up with. So you can tell us anything you'd like, but we really want to get to those by the end of your two minutes. So I'd like to have the first group begin. Who's representing first group? I think that's Heather's group. Yeah, or just get it that organized there. Okay. And while we're waiting, Kathy's going to sing a song for us. Kathy. <laughs> Not possible. <laughs> technical. I think it's technical. So we're going to move to group two. We're just having trouble locating the speaker for group one. Okay, Mariana, you're in group two. Who's reporting back? You are? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Wow, being the first one. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, we had a really good discussion in our in our small group, and I think the most important thing that came out of all of the values and 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 uh, points that were brought up is people. It has to be people centered. Um, in, in so many respects. Uh, so we spoke about things like uh, how important it is that every person feels that they are important, that they are seen, that they are heard, that they are a part of uh, who we are. So community is very important. Belonging is very important. Safety is very important so that nobody is afraid to come into our doors. Um, whether or not they show up broken and, and, and are never met by anyone. We don't, we don't want to see something like that. We want people to feel welcomed uh, and seen and uh, connected. Uh, and we felt that it was very important that in centering all of that, um, we would empower people to go out and be disciples. So that connection to the outside of community uh, was very important to us as well. Um, and empowering people as a value. Uh, 
Uh, we also made note of how important accessibility is, uh, looking at that really broadly. So, for example, whether or not people have internet access or, you know, what is their interaction with a physical space uh, and the importance of ensuring kind of uh, the sacred uh, aspect of a church uh, of a parish is wholly respected and, and protected and not secularized. Um, yeah. Excellent list, Mariana. Thank you so much. <laughs> He's humbled. <laughs> All right, group number three was with uh, Jessica Leslie. Thank you, Mariana, group, and your group. Group one is ready. Um, so if okay, we go so we'll, them. perfect. Thank you. There, now I'm unmuted. Hi, sorry, we were having trouble being unmuted. Nobody wanted to listen to us. <laughs> this is group one, and we talked about the renewed building and how uh, excited a social gathering space would be for everybody. And we actually had one lovely lady with us who had a beginning of a six months ago said she would not want a renewed building, but having followed are you not hearing me? We're hearing you, but not clearly. We're not seeing you. Okay. Is this better? Yep. I shout. Um, Our volume is up. Just a minute. Cheapers. About as high as you can go. Try now. If we can have speaker view. That would is be Is this great. better? We're just working on changing the view there. Can you hear me? Paulette, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, we, when speaking about the renewed building, uh, we had people that were very excited about having social gathering space distinct from the worship area. And one lady we were very fortunate to have with us six months ago said that she would have had nothing to do with any of this, but having followed everything that has been happening is suddenly flipped around thinks it's a wonderful idea. So obviously the work that is being done has been very successful. Um, um, what are the purposes of the building? Can't keep doing the same things as they were before. Be an example, be flexible, think of improvement for everyone. It is critical for young people to see how we dialogue and exchange ideas. Um, and as far as connection is concerned, we also need to recognize people um, as they come to church to have a community spirit, um, which is not there at the moment sometimes. Um, we need to evangelize to people who have no connections and no one to think or care particularly for them. Um, we need mutual spaces to meet and to get to know Jesus First, part of the outreach, we need space for that in the church. And as far as the actual physical building is concerned, what our group talked about um, was it has to be welcoming, bright, inviting. And then when people see it, they will say, wow, aesthetically pleasing, warm, cozy area for children and another area for seniors where they also will feel comfortable and feel at home. Supportive, safe for anyone with any kind of problem so that when you walk into that church, you feel like you're part of a family and that you could share how you're feeling. Um, another one was it should be lively as opposed to just prayerful. Not, we're not trying to get rid of prayerful, but we're <laughs> trying to be lively. Um, accessible for everybody, physically accessible. Um, Paulette, your last one just before that, could you repeat it? Before the accessibility? Before, before lively, your last one. Supportive? safe for anyone with any problems 
whether they're mental or physical, that you feel like you're among family, that you can go in and share with someone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sense and of then, Yes. Yeah. yeah, sense of family. I'm trying to find a word to, for that. Sensitive? Yeah. Sensitive, maybe, yeah. Supportive. Mm -hmm. And we talked about a place to pray quietly as, as well as uh, in a group. So if you want small to, chapel. yeah, small chapel, or I know that Father has spoken a little bit about that already. Um, we talked about a place that was lively and, you know, that people are not afraid to share their emotions. Um, curious. That the building makes you curious to go in. Mm -hmm. Curious. Makes you curious. We don't want the building to be curious. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Paulette. Group three. Jessica's group, Jessica Leslie. So for group three, we're gonna have Martha Pereira. Yeah, just, okay, great, thank you. Um, well, our group uh, definitely is for, from, you know, feels very hopeful because it, this is going to be promoting community. And this is for the future, not just for us, but we're opening to, towards the, the little ones that are to come. Um, we, we realize that today it serves us, but uh, it, it remaining like this uh, uh, ceases to serve the community. Uh, one of the things that came up was um, this, this need of conversion, of metanoia, understanding what it means, you know, uh, to be a personal, um, to be a personal action, inner action of conversion. I think that's still a puzzle uh, within within the community. Uh, what values we we share? Some of what have been expressed to be a welcoming place, um, uh, to be more in the community you know, to be, uh, the word was used, highlighted in the community um, that we're known by, you know, by, by the community that's out there. Uh, to be involved in the community and interactive, interactive. with the community. Um, there was a comment that innovation, the fact that we, there's cameras and streaming has allowed uh, one of our members to access uh, the church. She has uh, mobility problems, so she was she was really pleased and and uh, with with the implementation of technology. Um, another important component is the inclusivity for people with special needs, and uh, there's a suggestion, you know, sort of a, a sub room with dim lights and sensory board you know, for, for children who, who require such environment. And um, to be a parish uh, that understands children. So to welcome um, parental needs uh, so their children can participate. Excellent. Thank you so much. So for group four, we have Bob. Thank you. Hear you. <laughs> Go ahead, Bob. Okay. Our group was uh, very small. <laughs> and um, there were two people there <clears throat> who were very biased. One was me and the other was Roy. So that kind of set the tone to some extent. However, I don't think the other participants were shrinking violets. And so they're pretty candid. A lot of the discussion come up was very similar to what, what was raised here. But I, I, I think one of the things that did come up uh, was an agreement 
that this was the right place to be. This location was the right place to be. Uh, that doing something to renovate and expand on this facility is the right way to go. I think that um, the, there was a real eye opener in Father James' speech, and I don't overly want to praise him, but I, I will to some extent. When he described what the, what the various parishes could be, I think that really was an eye opener to most of us. And so overall, I, I, I think if one were to look at it, we want to be all of those things. And so uh, it's going to be a school. It's going to be an evangelizing place. It's going to be welcoming. It's going to be warm. But a couple of words that really come out and hit me on the way through uh, from our participants was alive. Quite important. And welcoming. And growing. Uh, and the fact uh, was mentioned that this parish, Our Lady of Guadalupe, has a lot to be proud of with respect to what's already happened at the St. Anthony campus. Something that is very uh, demonstrable uh, for where we're going to go. And so I guess in summation of it, there was some concern about losing a little bit of what we have, some concern of where the parking is going to be, a uh, little bit of concern, how are we going to afford it? Uh, there was a little bit of concern whether or not um, <clears throat> the die had already been cast and that uh, we'd already figured out what we're going to do and we're just going through an exercise to blow it past people. That's not quite the way it is. And so anyway, I, I guess, but uh, to conclude, uh, was welcoming, uh, people looking forward to uh, what it will be. And uh, in conclusion, I guess the, the final unanimous commentary was that we would be a beacon, that we would be the heart of Dartmouth. Anyway, it was fun. Thank you so much, Bob. Next we have for group five, Terry. Hi, folks. Can you hear me okay? Good. Yes, Terry. Thank okay. You. So we, we had a really dis exciting discussion. It was really exciting. First of all, I'll just go through the questions that were posed. So I'll quickly do this. But so, what, the first question that was asked was, how do we feel currently about re the, new, the renewal? And the adjectives that we came up with, um, the, the predominant adjective was hopefulness. We're ready. Um, we're reflective. It's causing us to be reflective. And uh, one person mentioned a disappointment mm -hmm. that we, all of us collectively, had allowed the church uh, to come to this point. But I guess on the other hand, uh, we had to come to this point to go in another direction. So uh, there was a really good discussion there. Uh, with question two, um, of what assumption had the father caused us to reflect upon? And the main assumption uh, that we uh, talked about was the fact that we have not been an evangelizing organization. We've been in a maintenance mode for a long time, and maybe we can even say um, that dreaded word, we were in many ways a club. Uh, but we didn't dwell on that. There, our main discussion came upon question three, uh, which is rightful. That's where we should have been discussing, and that's where uh, we dwelt most of the time. And that question was, if successful, what adjectives uh, would describe the new state by parishioners and non-parishioners? Well, wasn't that fun? It really was fun. So um, we even, I, I'm just gonna run right to, <laughs> just be, bear with me, please. Uh, I'm gonna run right to uh, one thing we, uh, we started building already, and I know we're well ahead of ourselves, but we, we want a statue of Mary somewhere on the property yeah uh, so, because <laughs> because mary so, uh, Terry, just let me bring yes. you back for a moment we're there, not 
at this point, we're looking for values. We're not looking for, because that's what we're going to do next week. We're going to get into how do we take these values and what do they translate into in our structures or in our space. So yeah. if I've got that. If you can just give us the sure. values, that would be perfect. Sure. So here's what we came up with. We want the, uh, the building and the property and the values to be a beacon. This was a long discussion we had on beacon. And that's what got us down to the, what I call the rabbit hole of the Statue of Mary and so on. But to be a beacon, and we had a long discussion about the location of the church being uh, overlooking Solomon's Pond and the significance of that point in Dartmouth which is the heart of Dartmouth, Solomon's Pond, Lake Banook, and so on. Okay. And so yeah. we need to be a beacon and, and to, uh, to all who pass by. And to be forward-looking, that was a word that we talked about a lot. Forward-looking. Forward-looking. Evangelizing was talked about a lot. Uh, to be a center of light was, was uh, talked about, illuminating and the center of light. Uh, to somehow reflect climate change. That was important to us. Um, light was mentioned uh, so, so much. Accessibility was mentioned mm -hmm. uh, a whole bunch. And family orientation was very big. Welcoming was, was big on our list. Uh, I'm just looking here. So, so I, I guess we could say another important point that was discussed was the history. Uh, we need to capture the history of our parish as it was in the past, history of the past, distant past, and how we're going about this now so that we can pass on our values and our history to, our, to the next generations. All right, that sounds excellent. Thank you so much, Terry. So next we have group six. We have uh, Sean and Michelle. We have Sean. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Sean, due to yes. our timing right now, can we, we want to get all of your information, but we're going to skip down to our values uh, as I have Father James on the floor now and <laughs> at the bottom. So if we could skip to those and we'll get the, uh, we'll have all of the facilitators send us uh, information about the discussions because we do want to know about them. Very, very well. Uh, on number three, we uh, discussed that, that we, the uh, building, to, we would think that the building would look, it would be welcoming, beautiful, spirituality, uh, very friendly, not domineering, flexible, in a great location. Central, multifunctional, uh, showing support of. You need and, to slow uh, down a little for us. Okay. Uh, welcoming. Welcoming. Okay. <laughs> it's a we got that central location is uh, is uh, one of the big big ones. Multifunctional. And multifunctional. Multifunctional. And the, and the fact that we feel that they will know it's, um, it is a Catholic, uh, but more so a, a Christian too as well for the downtown area, location. Um, and it's inclusive. We would feel that we feel that it's, uh, it's flexible and inclusive. Flexible and inclusive. And an open door policy. We really want to look at the fact that most hopefully having it uh, at, uh, it'd be open more than just for mass. Uh, the only thing, the last thing uh, that we, we took the, a unanimous vote that Father James should celebrate his 50th anniversary of ordination as our pastor at Our Lady of Guadalupe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. So next for group seven is Denise. Yes, hi everybody. So just focusing then on question three. Yes. Um, right, I'll tell you some of the things that we talked about. Um, we would like our community, our parish to be described as non judgmental, welcoming, caring, full of hope, 
as other people have said, the heart or the hub of the community, charitable. We also had a little discussion about curiosity. We would like people to wonder why we're growing our building. What are we doing that is bringing in more people so that they might be curious to join us? And one last thing I'll mention that came up in the earlier questions but hasn't been mentioned is that there is a need for healing for particularly young people who are people who don't currently feel like they're welcome in the church and that our spaces should should also reflect that and and give that opportunity for them to feel that. That's a really great point. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Joe Beaton for group eight. Hello. Um, I'm going to skip right to the uh, characteristics then for uh, uh, we're going to, we, we want the church to be welcoming, inclusive, interesting, curious, hospitable, and resourceful. Now, that, that last question, I'm going to read the question uh, as it was presented to us. If we successfully renew our building, what adjectives will be used to describe it by parishioners and people who are not parishioners. So I want to focus in for just for a second on people who are not parishioners. People on the outside looking in to see a new building going up. We have to face the fact that some people are going to be negative towards that. You know, we don't want it, but it's, we have to face the reality that people are saying, why are they spending the money on that church when it could be going to the poor or you know residential survivors or that type of thing? So we we have to face that reality that there is going to be negative. I, I don't want to focus on that, but it's there. So getting back to the other adjectives, that uh, the positive attitudes would be welcoming, inclusive, interesting, curious, hospitable, and resourceful. Thank you. Oh. This, this, it'll cycle back on. It'll it? cycle back up there. So next we have for group nine is Doreen. Hello, we, we had a good discussion. Um, we've had, we have many, uh, we had a few laughs and we were getting off track at times, but our, uh, our main purpose um, for our parish is for fellowship and to, uh, to support the community, not only our parishioners, but to be open and welcoming and supportive. Um, we, we would like to see some educational purposes for the church and have, a, have that chapel or a space to go and worship, have an open door policy for not only the community, but for parishioners. Um, we talked about um, educational purposes and, um, and have, have the community curious of what we're doing. We had the same feeling and we didn't use the word curious, but um, you know, we, we want it to be, uh, re we want them to see that we're renewed and that we um, all have a renewed heart and that our community is attracted to that. Um, yeah, and discipleship and, and evangelization is, it, you know, was talked about. Um, yeah, so I think uh, it's pretty well what everyone said, but we'd like, you know, like maybe a, a space to go for 24 hour adoration. Um, and yeah, and our church needs to be visible. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. Thank you. And our next group, we have Hilda. Hello. So we also, uh, we got off track a bit, but for, for adjectives, our main ones were functionality. We want to have a colorful, vibrant, vibrant space and a warm, welcoming space for all, uh, including transgender. Um, and there was also some discussion that there in our group as well about the reaction to doing a large renovation 
and how some might think that we're jumping the gun um, going ahead and doing that um, before we build our, our uh, parish community first. And um, that was our, our main uh, points for, for number three. Thank you. And our last group from Zoom, group 11, is Kathleen. Hi, everyone. Um, we had a great discussion in our group. Uh, one of the things we talked about, um, the two concepts that came up in the first part that I thought were really interesting um, was the idea that we learn about God through other people. And we want this space that we create to be a place that unlike just this, having a space of worship, a large space of worship, that it's a place where we can experience um, God through others. Um, the other concept that came up was the feelings from the different parishes coming together um, and that this construction hopefully will allow us to reframe this as a project that is ours uh, because one of the group members had said, you know, ownership can create a sense of belonging and if everybody feels that this isn't just St. Peter's amped up but that it's actually a completely new project that is Our Lady of Guadalupe that that can be something that brings us closer together as a parish. Um, we talked we, we talked about the idea of uh, you know it being a third space so anyone here who perhaps participated in uh, some of the talks that they did for creating the new libraries in Halifax, one of the concepts they had spoken about was your first space is your home, your second space is work or school, but what, really la we, what, what we really lack in our community is a third space that doesn't cost anything. You have to pay to go to a coffee shop, you have to uh, be a member of a club somewhere, but if St. Peter's uh, former location, Our Lady of Guadalupe, could be that third space for our community, um, we talked about the concepts of being inviting, being accessible, not only for physical, uh, you know, needs and so on and so forth, um, but in terms of transit and so on, and having that third space be a combination of modern, but honoring our past. A lot of the buildings that have gone up in Halifax recently, you can see some of them will they'll, where they'll even incorporate other parts of a building to make sure that it's reflective so that we can have the architecture communicate that. Um, and then lastly, because I know we're trying to wrap things up, um, something that creates that home away from home feeling um, and that we want it to be a vital dynamic part of the community, but also a place for reflection. So something that is a space that can accommodate that whole spectrum. Really great ideas. Thank you, Kathleen. I think we're left with our in church. And so Malcolm, do you want to come forth and give us some report? I know we're running out of time, so I'll be super quickly with these words. Hospitality, inclusive, family oriented, also children-oriented, welcoming, and ministry-oriented. Malcolm was able to slow down and uh, stay with Father James, so that's great by being in person here. You could see that. and. Perfect, thank you. And Tony, you want to come up for our last group? Well, I'm not 100% sure what we can add to the list since we're number 14 or 12 or 13, whatever we are, but we did come up with community, accessibility, a place that's welcoming and comfortable, a place that's non-judgmental, and inviting, visibility, because of our location, but visibility, um, worshiping, <laughs> a 
and porous, <laughs> um, which uh, makes uh, people feel that they can come into the building. So someone walking along the street uh, would feel as if they were welcomed into the, into the church. Um, and family-oriented was our last one as well. That's it. Amazing. Thank you all for a spectacular job. And thank you, Father James, for being the scribe. I'm excited to hear about all of your answers to your other questions. And whoever would be reporting back from those groups that was unable to do that, if you would send it, uh, your uh, thoughts from your group, if you would forward that to us at dreaming at ourladyofguadalupe.ca, we would, as the Dreaming Committee, really appreciate to get those. We will be putting something together for our next meeting in two weeks, and I invite you to do a little daydreaming in the meantime about what that might look like, because as we move through this process, it gets more and more exciting as we start to look at it taking form and taking shape. So speaking of that, next, our next uh, gathering together is in two weeks, and it will be Saturday, February 5th. And if you're not on the beach, could you join us? That's for Mary. <laughs> From 1 to 3 p.m. We will have a member of Divine Renovation, Fiona O'Reilly, and I think Fiona's online today, to provide an engaging presentation to us regarding the future. And we're going to return to the qualities, the characteristics, and the values to look at how our current and future future space perhaps will support these values moving forward. Now I'm sure in each of your groups you just wanted to get right there. I'm sure there was a pulling back by the facilitators to um, not necessarily go there yet because it's not time, but we will start to move in that direction. Allow yourself to dream and combine this with the power of prayer. Thank you everyone for your participation this afternoon. Thank you for everyone who's here in person. Father James, everyone in our tech booth for all of their assistance in making this happen. And Father James will give us a summation and our closing prayer. So thank you, Kathy, and thanks everyone. You know, when I met with the group this week, we said, you know, we, the goal is to come out of this meeting with maybe 20, 25, 20 to 30 values would be amazing. Well, now some of these are repeats, of course, but I think we've got a lot more. And what we're going to do is we're, we're going to have to bring them together. But as Kathy said, in two weeks, we're going to, I mean, what a discussion to say. Accessibility, that's a huge conversation, isn't it, about what that means for the space. Uh, visibility, like this is like, this is very, very exciting. I'm really excited about all of this. So thank you all for being here. I want to conclude with a quick story. And again, it comes from my last experience in a parish, which was the result of a dreaming process and the building of a new building. But it tells the story of a young woman who had been away from church for most of her life, who had experienced church as unwelcoming and judgmental and felt that she would be judged and rejected. And but she was hungry for God. And she came with her child and she came into the back of the building. For three months, she stood in the foyer. And she slowly got closer and closer to the day she was able to enter in and sit in the back pew. And she went on to be welcomed and had a, a, a transformation in her life. And I remember at a gathering, a leadership summit where we met with all the leaders of the parish, uh, she shared her story. And Father Simon Lobo, the pastor at the time, got up and he said, we built this church for you. 
And I remember it went like a, in a beautiful way, like a knife through my soul. Like it, it, I actually wept because it's like, yes, we didn't know who she was. We don't know who the people are in the future. If we successfully renew this building that will serve for another 50 years, 50 years, who are the people whose lives are going to be touched and transformed by what we do? That's who we're doing it for, folks, not for ourselves. We're going we're gonna to build what God is calling us to build for those people, whoever they are. We don't know who they are, but God knows. So thank you all, all of you all now. What a beautiful turnout and for being here in person. And as, and as we heard as Kathy say, let's, let's, I hope you daydream a lot in the next two weeks. Take some prayer time. Grab onto your favorite characteristics, uh, values, and dream about what that could be like and come back with some magic in two weeks from now, okay? Oh, closing prayer. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Thank you all, and God bless. Take care.